All right, good afternoon. Welcome to the Harris County District Attorney's Office in the Criminal Justice Center. Uh, I'm joined today by the special agent in charge of the uh, DEA, Daniel Como. To my left, uh, to my right, I'm, I'm uh, joined by Dr. Corey, <laughs> I'm trying this, Champatazzi, we'll spell it later. Uh, also, Chief Josh Brueger, Sheriff Ed Gonzalez, and Chief Ernest Garcia of HPD. And we're here today to announce our joint strategy to curtail the recent surge in fatal fentanyl overdose cases by ensuring prison for those who profit from the addiction caused by fentanyl and treatment for those addicted to fentanyl. Fentanyl, as you all know, is a powerful opioid, uh, maybe 50 times stronger than heroin and 100 times stronger than morphine. And it's been responsible for nearly half of the 1,096 overdose deaths in Harris County in 2022. Sadly, 74% of those among 14 to 25-year-olds comprise that 1,096 victim statistic. The victims in these cases are often unaware that they are taking fentanyl because they're purchasing or being given illicitly manufactured pills or other substances. And so the increased impact of counterfeit drugs in our community is killing our kids. In response to this crisis, the Harris County District Attorney's Office has created and is implementing this week a major narcotics unit assigned to work major cases in partnership with these law enforcement leaders' agencies, the DEA, the HPD, the Sheriff's Office, Pasadena PD, and other county law enforcement agencies. Uh, and our prosecutors will be providing as experts legal support for the investigation of fatal overdose cases as homicides. The prosecution of these cases can be handled under a current Texas law in the Health and Safety Code, uh, delivery of drugs causing death, or they can be prosecuted as negligent homicide, manslaughter, or even murder. To investigate and uh, prosecute these cases, uh, the leaders that you see here before us have also assigned experts in their agencies. So they're working together in a combined task force, and they are targeting commercial traffickers, reaping the profit of transporting shipments of what amounts to poison. And of course, we have a large treatment program and court that is a collaborative with, uh, between the judges, the probation department, our office, and the defense bar. And that has been very effective at helping those who become addicted to fentanyl and other drugs. Uh, our prosecutors meet regularly, unfortunately, with families of fatal overdoses. And the news is terrible. Uh, what I would tell you is this is impacting all of us at every economic and socio level in every, uh, every group I can think of. And so we all need to pull together to stop this problem. Um, our concept is simple. It's force multiplying because we know that criminal groups sometimes using industrial sized pill presses to make counterfeit pills using fentanyl as a cheap and often fatal ingredient, uh, they're making, every, they're really putting everyone in Harris County at danger, and no one taking illicit drugs is safe. We know some labs can produce 150,000 pills a day, and those pills, labeled as Adderall, Oxy, Xanax, all have one thing in common, they can kill you. So today, I really want to thank my partners in law enforcement, uh, Chief Garcia, Special Agent Charge Como, Josh Brueger, Pasadena P PD Chief, and 
Ed Gonzalez, Sheriff of Harris County, for force multiplying, for assigning dedicated staff who are experts in drug enforcement to work with our experts in drug prosecution and to try to ease the burden and the trauma that our emergency rooms and our health care providers are facing daily. We have more people dying of this than murder. It's time that we took strong action, and I'm pleased to introduce one of our partners to that strong action, Special Agent in Charge of the DEA locally, Danny Como. Thank you. I appreciate that. Look, I'm very excited to be here to talk to you about this problem. And what's even more exciting, especially for the citizens of Houston, Harris County, is that us, our law enforcement partners, are working together. We're working together as one. We don't care about the credit. Right now, we just want to solve a problem. This is definitely a problem. Right now, we started this new task force, and all of our partners are putting bodies in this task force to take care of you, the citizens of Houston, and to also put out the message to let you know the dangers, what's happening right now with this fentanyl, to let you know that the Sinaloa cartels, the CJNG cartels, doesn't care about your life. They care about making money. That's what's important to them right now. So we want to put a stop to that. We want to let you know that we're going after those who are profiting from these drugs causing overdose deaths. We're coming after you. We will put you in jail. Additionally, right now, this task force is working on over 30 investigations right now where overdose deaths have occurred. Starting at the age of 14, we're working cases where teenagers are dying. We will do our job to give a good investigation to the district attorney's office so they can do their job and put them in jail and get justice for the families where these deaths have occurred. It's very important to us. And parents, one thing you need to understand, you have to know what your kids are doing. You have to stay in touch. Right now, social media is a beast. It is where these drug cartels are making money. They are utilizing apps on cell phones to sell these dangerous poison to your kids. If you don't check your kids' phones, if you don't check their rooms, you'll never know what's happening. And right now, we have far too many kids overdosing. We need to put a stop to this. A lot of it is awareness, it's education to help us do our jobs. And we will put the bad ones in jail that are selling this poison. And before I end, I want to simply show two pictures. And oftentimes, people are not understanding what these drug cartels are doing. I have two pictures here. They look simple, easy. Both of them are prescription pills. One is made by the drug cartel, and the other's made by a legitimate pharmacy, comes from a legitimate pharmacy. And oftentimes you'll look at it and say, wow, clearly this is the good one. This is the one that I should take that's going to help me with my health. Actually, this is the one made by the drug cartel. This is it right here. They're doing a better job in quality of work than the one that actually helps us get better. So you just have to be aware, understand what's going on out there, and let's all work together as one to help this problem. Thank you so much, Special Agent Como. Excellent, excellent work. We believe this makes drug enforcement more relevant today than ever. I also would like to invite up HPD, our longtime partner. We work shoulder to shoulder with him every day, Chief Ernest Garcia. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ernest Garcia, Assistant Chief of the Houston Police Department or our Special Investigations Command. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the Houston Police Department, I want to thank you, DA, for allowing us uh, and all our partners here, our different agencies who join us today uh, to help send a strong message that law enforcement in Houston and Harris County is banding together to investigate and target drug offenders attempting to poison our kids and citizens with fentanyl, like the DA just got through saying, and, and Special Agent Como. Uh, before I, when I, while I'm here this afternoon, I want to introduce uh, two of our investigators that we have at the Houston Police Department and our overdose squad. I'm pleased that they're here with me this afternoon, 
uh, we have Sergeant uh, Stalen. He's there in the back. We have uh, Senior Officer uh, Ed, Ed Lopez. They're assigned to our, like I said, our overdose squad is assigned to narcotics uh, with, our, with our Houston Police Department. Uh, they do an excellent job for us. Uh, and they work in tandem with our, our DEA, DEA partners uh, here in Houston. So uh, we're pleased to have them here today, and, and, they, and thank you, for, your, thank you for, your, uh, for, the, for the great work that you're doing. Um, these investigators are supported uh, by intelligence analysts working at the Houston in, uh, Intelligence Support Center that identify likely overdoses throughout Harris County and support efforts of the investigators in identifying individuals who are believed to be responsible for distributing fentanyl whether it be in the form of powder or contained within counterfeit pills. Overdose investigations uh, that these investigators do, I want to point out, are pretty time int intensive. They take a lot of time to, to do the follow-ups, um, and they're similar to homicide investigations. Um, the cir circumstances surrounding these investigations um, prove difficult to, to, uh, to prove at some, at some point, but uh, they're, 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 they're something that we take uh, um, seriously with the, with the department. So I'm going to give you a little bit of stats over the, over the last 12 months from uh, April 1st, 22, 2022 to March 31st of, of this year. Uh, the Houston Intelligence Support Center identified over 700 fentanyl-related incidents consisting of fatal and non-fatal overdoses in which fentanyl was either suspected or confirmed, as well as arrests involving fentanyl. So closely working with the DA's office, um, the, 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 the overdose unit has charged several individuals uh, with controlled substance causing death since two, 2021. And in furtherance of these investigations, we're also able to identify the second level uh, some of these distributors that are that are distributing the fentanyl. So all in all, uh, we're very proud of our investigators here in our overdose cases, uh, and uh, look forward to working with the DA in the county and also our partners at the DA uh, in these investigations. So thank you very much for having us. Chief, thank you so much. Uh, these officers assigned to work with DEA are lawyers assigned to work with the it's it's really uh, a county-wide collaboration and we do appreciate it being centered uh, in and around the DEA um, I also would like to introduce at this time Dr. Corey Champatazzi I practiced that because she was kind enough to come down here last minute invitation because we wanted the public to hear from our healthcare community exactly what they're seeing. Doctor? Thank you for having me today. Like she said, I'm Corey Chumpitazi, a pediatric emergency medicine physician, and I thank you all for your work in this area. We are definitely seeing more overdoses, some unintentional, and the toddler who is wobbly and a little bit not acting normal, who's gotten into a parent's medication that they think is candy. Um, and then we definitely see the teenagers as well, who are um, some looking um, to get high or, or um, from a medicinal purpose, but also those who are really anxious and are struggling and, and get a pill from their friend that might then be laced with something. So I really thank Special Agent Como for that, that advice on, on knowing what your kids are up to and what they're doing and, and education about, about those pills because the, in addition to the fentanyl, a lot of the times they're made in presses with other medications. We know that over 3 million kids less than 19 had prescriptions for opioids, and so we as a medical community as well need to help with safe prescribing, with using the Texas prescription drug monitoring and other resources. Um, and um, really, this epidemic is hitting everybody, um, children, families. Thank you very much, Doctor. Well, I want to point out, uh, before we, we go to our call to action, I'd like uh, the prosecutors assigned to our major narcotics unit, whether at Rick Court uh, or in major narcotics per se, could you all raise your hands? All told, investigators, support staff, and prosecutors, 15 people between drug treatment court and traditional 
prosecution of dealers, and there will be a clear path in this county. I think we all talked at the end of our preparatory time about a call to action for parents and why it's important. And I just asked each person, uh, what could you tell parents that they should do or shouldn't do to help us in law enforcement and in health care stop this terrible epidemic? And I just invite uh, you all one by one to come up, Sheriff. Uh, Chief Brueger, maybe next. Thank you. Um, and I'll say some brief comments in Spanish as well. But um, most, most importantly, I think many of the leaders up here have touched on it. Um, I think it's important to really be engaged with your children, with your teens, with college students, just to know what they're doing. Uh, Sat Como spoke about the importance of checking on, on, on cell phones. Th th this, this can be obtained via apps, for example. Uh, pill presses are in storage rooms throughout the county. And so it's important to be nosy, be a nosy parent, go into the bedrooms, as one of the investigators told us uh, in the pre-meeting as well, go into it, know the passcodes as well. You know, all that's incredible intelligence that we might be able to use should something tragic happen. But I think it's very alarming when we hear of the hundreds of deaths that are happening here in our backyard related to fentanyl. Uh, and, and, and I don't think we're talking enough about it. So I want to commend DA Aug for her leadership, her team, everyone, this collaborative effort, because it really takes everyone uh, to, to, to help put a stop to this because it's happening in our backyard. Uh, often we've heard about it in the East Coast, the Northeast, and the border, whatever. It's happening here in our backyard right now, and many, many people are dying, and so we have to do everything we can to put a stop to it. On the other end as well, uh, we're also ramping up uh, through the DA's office and her efforts uh, additional focus on the uh, RIC court, the reintegration court as well, so we could try to emphasize treatment as well. Uh, not just the punishment and enforcement of it, but also on the prevention and intervention side of things. I think that's critical. Brevemente en español, uh, escuchamos, uh, estas pastillas pueden ser mortal, uh, es veneno realmente, y si las ven, está, son muy similares las pastillas. Hemos visto un gran número de over, uh, sobredosis aquí en nuestro, en nuestro condado, y, y, y lo que es diferente de esto es que solamente una pastilla puede ser fatal. Entonces, los padres queremos que pongan mucha atención a lo que está pasando. Muchas veces uh, respetamos el espacio de nuestros hijos y pensamos, no, pues es su habitación o, o es su teléfono, voy a respetar eso. Pero una pastilla simplemente, si la ve, tiene que tener sospecho, sospecha, porque muchas veces en nuestra comunidad estamos pensando, por ejemplo, de un cigarrillo o algo que están tal vez fumando porque tra tradicionalmente en nuestras casas no mirábamos pastillas que eran así, pensábamos que era solamente uh, una prescripción de un médico, pero ahora son fatales y pueden, hemos visto muchos adolescentes que están perdiendo su vida en nuestra comunidad. Thank you, Sheriff. Chief Berger. Josh Berger with the Pasadena Police Department. Um, as a father of three kids, um, I, I cannot stress, you know, the importance of getting in your kids' business. Um, knowing um, what's in their bedrooms, know what's in their cars, know what's in their cell phones. Um, it, investigators, you know, getting into to cell phones if, you know, in an overdose death, it, it holds a, you know, treasure trove of information for the investigators to begin their investigation. And can't tell you how many times we get out there and, and ask parents for the passcode of their kids' phones, and they don't know it. And, and so it, it's extremely important um, that you're in your kids' business. And the other thing I want to say is this, is, Really, it's, it's been a change of mindset, I think, for the criminal justice community and the community at large when we're talking about overdose deaths. Um, too often, we, we've stepped back and said, oh, it's an overdose death. They've made this decision. Um, that's not the case, especially when we start talking about fentanyl. The number of, of people that just don't know what they're ingesting. A friend tells them this is what it is. They believe it. They take it, and they end up dead, and it's a crime, and we need to look at it as a crime and investigate it as a crime um, and bring the appropriate charges um, if the investigation leads to that. So thank you all. Chief Garcia, any words for parents? I'm going to say the same thing as the other leaders here have said. It, it's, you need to be nosy. You need to be nosy and know what you're doing and what your child is doing. Uh, who, who's their friends, where are they going when they're out with their friends. Uh, a lot of our kids have the, the games, the Playstations, the, the, the Xboxes. 
Uh, we see uh, the apps and the phones uh, that are sometimes titled something else and when in fact they're geared towards something else that they shouldn't be doing. Uh, but I think the message today uh, is just be involved with your kids. Uh, you have to be nosy. Uh, some, some folks that we talk to that, well, I don't want to step into their, into, their, into their space, into their room, because uh, that's their space. Uh, you need to be in their space, especially when they're juveniles. Uh, one of those pills is all you need, uh, and, and so one of those pills can kill. Uh, so it's very important to be active and engaged with what your kids are doing. Chief, thank you. Yes. As a, a mom, we've had that conversation, my son and I and our family, because everyone needs to know you can't tell the difference. The person giving it to you might not know. Uh, I want to uh, thank the people who formed our major narcotics squad, our prosecutors, investigators, I really appreciate what you're doing. Our treatment prosecutors, Maritza Sharma leads uh, the effort in Rick Court. Maritza, raise your hand so they know who you are. They handle over 4,000 cases a year of people charged with possession of drugs, and they are having great results. It has helped with our jail population. It has helped with our community, and we see a lower recidivism rate. So we're taking a balanced approach, but I want every Houstonian to know that from today forward, there's a very clear delineation in the way we prosecute and investigate dealers and traffickers who are profiting off the deaths of individuals by the thousands nationwide and over a thousand here. And a very clear path of treatment for individuals who are arrested and being prosecuted for possession, because that is what works. So thank my partners. Uh, we'll open it up for a few questions. Sir. I, I wonder if you can talk to us a little bit of why now. Was there a case or some moment that, that someone in this group said, we need to have this? Because we've talked about fentanyl for years now, since 2019 on this board. Why, why now? Why this now? Well, we're all... Uh, using our resources as well as we possibly can. All of us in law enforcement are being asked every day to do more with less. And we have come to the agreement and um, concept that force multiplying through collaboration is the best way to have an impact at the federal, state, and local level. So we've always needed it. The idea of prosecuting drug dealing that ends in a fatal result is a new practice area. The laws dealing with it have just come about. There's additional legislation pending before uh, the Texas legislature that could change that even further. So while it was possible, I think uh, that these law enforcement chiefs and leaders have, have hit on it. Our country's changing their perspective on criminal justice, on drugs, on how we treat users, and how we treat traffickers. And I think that's what you're seeing mirrored in our collaboration. And then healthcare, they, you know, they need the assistance of our criminal justice community. They are trying single-handedly, I think, uh, to deal with it. So that's, that's the reason for now. Are these corridors, are they all minority, minority or all types of nationalities? Are they, are they focusing more on minority kids? I would say, as as you you have better data on it too, but it it hits all all echelons, all all races, all classes, all all ethnicities. Yeah, I would agree with that. Right now, it's it's anybody and everybody. It's not one class. It's not the high class. It's not the low class, middle class. It's everybody. Kim, some just some particulars with regard to your task force. When was it launched? Is it officially today? Was it launched about a month ago? No, we've all been working on this for months. Okay. Uh, and different agencies have come on at different times. We have had uh, a person assigned to major narcotics. That's Garrett Moore, our chief of this division. But to build it up, to find the resources among my 300 and 
uh, some lawyers is is tough, but we've added to it. We've had Mirza Sharma in charge of our treatment court, Rick Court, as, as you've heard it, the collaborative, uh, f- for six years now, and it actually started in 2016 before my administration. So we've all had people assigned, but this concept of working together as a force multiplier is not a new concept, but we're, uh, we're getting it right today. I mean, there's very staff today. There. We know that. So, with Ed, if you don't mind jumping in here, Sheriff. Does, the, does Harris County or Pasadena PD now have officers designated from narcotics just for fentanyl and who are going to be strictly for this task force? Yeah, uh, I think also to the previous questions of, of, of why did we arrive here, I think in many ways we've all started seeing, you know, the, 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 the need for this even more. And, and some, like the Houston Police Department, have already been more more embedded into the task force specific to this type of investigation. Ironically, even before this press conference, I had already reached out to to the SAC telling him, we need to talk about this because we need to be more involved as well in the task force as well. His his initiative as well, the DA reached out and said, hey, we all need to be working together with her, uh, with the way she was going to add additional resources to her unit. And then, so it's all coming together now uh, where we could form this collaborative. Uh, and so now we're going to be assigning folks as well to that. We, it, it, uh, I mean, you know, obviously we're all strapped for resources. We, right. we have a number of different challenges uh, incoming all at once, uh, but at least a pair to start with, you know, and again, we still have to work out those details. But even uh, we were at, uh, at an event at City Hall and we were talking about the need for this type of investigation. That was months ago. Uh, what, what event was that? The, the Red Ribbon Week or, or yes. yeah, where we uh, kind of joined with, with victims of overdoses and survivors. And so it's something that, look, it's still a work in progress. Uh, but I was alarmed when I independently also checked with our uh, Harris County Institute of Forensic Science, and I learned about, at that time, hundreds of deaths that were linked to, to fentanyl. So it's really scary that's happening in our backyard. And it's potent, it's quick, um, and so it's very alarming what's happening. And how will it work when you bring the DEA in? Because obviously federal mm-hmm. law enforcement has a much greater powers, and also from a prosecutorial standpoint. Kim, how are you going to make that decision in terms of going with feds on this case or whether your office will be the one that will be prosecuting it? I'll answer that. I'd like... Chief Ruger, to answer your last question, because he's, he's got you, Chief. Uh, some that. information that's really important to Harris County and Pasadena. So real quick, uh, what we found is we're operating in silos. And so you send homicide out to work this overdose, um, and they're really good at investigating that, but they don't have the narcotics. That, that's another special. And so putting the experts together sounds like a novel concept, and sometimes we might be a little slow to the party, but um, this is one of those where we realize that we're going to be much more effective if we have the experts in, in both fields working together on this. And so that's that's really the true benefit of this is is working together, um, both within our own agencies and with the other agencies and the partners, because everybody's got different resources. And, you know, like everybody up here has talked about, you know, resources is, you know, how do we make the most of our manpower right now? And, you know, working together, obviously we get the most bang for our buck that way. So. So. To, to kind of echo what the chief just said, that's exactly what's happening in our task force. We've had this task force together, but it wasn't complete because DEA, we, we investigate drugs. That's what we do. Um, now our task force is going to be complete because HPD has given us guys with uh, homicide experience. Right now we have one teed up from Harris County, and, and I tell you what, I've been hearing so many good things about this deputy, and he has – homicide experience and narcotics experience, and he's coming over to this group. The great thing with the prosecution in Harris County, from the DA to the federal prosecution, we're going to work together as one. Wherever we get the biggest bang for the case, that's where we're going to go. We're all putting our badges in one bucket, and we're saying what's best for the community. What's best to put the bad guy in jail? Where is he going to get the most time at? Some things we can't get federal. And I am so happy that DEA Og is saying, hey, I'm in. I want to be a part of this. We're going to do this together. And that's what she's doing right now, along with our county and state partners. So we're going to do as ever best, ultimately, to put the folks in jail, to put the bad guys in jail. And we've talked about that already. So there won't be any issues. Whatever's, whatever's best, federal or state, that's where we're going. Did that answer your question, Maria? Uh, he's been asking a question just for a minute. Sorry. Go ahead.
causing the problem. Um, you mentioned the treatment. Treatment now, and I, I just, I'm going to say it on that now, treatment, you can't afford it. If you would like to honestly look to get help, you would, if you don't have insurance, you can't, it's, it's really hard for people to get help out there. And you can do law enforcement, it's great, but you have to do that treatment aspect of things. And the, the treatment court is one thing that, that's great, that we need help to hear. But what else can be done on that front? Well, in terms of providing more social services, I think the City of Houston Health Department and the County's Health Department could certainly step up and offer more treatment at low cost or no cost for Houstonians. I think that's part of their job. Uh, in terms of law enforcement, our job is not treatment itself, but to connect as conduits with treatment providers. I'd ask Maritza Sharma just to come up for a minute, uh, give you just a little information on our treatment court, would you mind, and kind of what we're seeing, because there's, a, there's really good changes happening in criminal justice and in America about the way we perceive things. And when it comes to drug addiction, I think many of us in both parties on all sides of the aisle are agreeing that treatment works. And when we have people in the justice system that are addicted, uh, we're providing treatment and taxpayers are paying for that and that's through our adult probation department. But let me let Maritza tell you a little bit more about it. My name is Maritza Sharma. I am the uh, chief of the Responsive Interventions for Change docket. And our goal in this docket that um, basically what we seek to do as opposed to sending people to jail for possession of a low-level drug offense is so once they are identified as having an addiction, whether it be just the beginning of an addiction, let's say that they're just beginning to be addicted to Adderall and they're exploring meth, uh, or those who have been using narcotics for a long time, whether it be heroin, fentanyl, or a hardcore methamphetamine uh, addiction, our goal is not to send them to jail. Our goal is to get them treatment, whatever that may be, whether it be community residential, outpatient treatment in the, in the community, or lockdown treatment, so that these individuals, they stop committing offenses, whether it be just simple drug offenses, or um, crimes such as assault, or burglary of a habitation, things like that, to feed their addiction. The goal is to get them treatment so that they stop committing uh, additional offenses, and that they, they can become just a normal member of society once again, just like you and I, without that burden of the addiction. And if I can, I'll encourage you to look in your press packets. There's some really great statistics about the reduction in jail uh, population in terms of people charged with possession of a controlled substance. I mean, it is much lower than the state rate, so I encourage you to look at that. And I just want to commend the prosecutors like Sharma who work with her and for her in that court. It's a different dedication, and that's what we're seeing in criminal justice is basically we are responding to our community's problems, needs, and I think desires in terms of alternative treatments that don't disqualify people from the workforce. That's what I'm big on. I want everybody to get well enough that they can work and help us all uh, in this in this Houston economy, make it vibrant. So uh, so we're seeing a, a, some real changes there. I had one, one person ahead of you. Um, Telemundo? Yes. Sorry, <laughs> no, no, it's okay. <laughs> Yeah. But also you mentioned something key here, uh, that sometimes a friend would give another friend a pill, and the friend might not know what it is also. So in terms of prosecution, how can we go back to find out where that pill comes from? I'm pretty sure parents are also going to be wondering, what about if my kid gets a hold of the pill and I give it to a friend and my kid is going to be in trouble? Is that what it is? Well, I think that's a legitimate concern. Yes, a child can can uh, harm themselves not just by taking a drug, but by 
delivering or dealing or even giving a drug to another person. And can they be criminally liable? Yes. Now, the difference between these commercial traffickers who bring in loads of fentanyl, uh, often uh, with a border nexus, that's why I've got our border prosecutor involved, that's Jim O'Donnell. Um, I, I just think that each case will be investigated individually. And certainly you have family members who've given it to another family member and they didn't know. So each case has to be looked at individually. These will be presented to grand juries. That's 12 members of the community. When officers think that charges are appropriate and once our lawyers have reviewed the facts and evidence. But it will be, uh, it is not just prosecution for everyone. I just want dealers to know there's a clear path into prison and whether you're dealing something fatal or not it's like Russian roulette don't take anybody's life uh, into your own hands like that and and don't take yours yeah please uh, to your question uh, the legislature right now is considering a, a bill as well that would uh, change the definition, if you will, of testing strips to, to where right now it's considered paraphernalia and, and they could, somebody could be charged for them. I, I can't speak for everyone else, but I'm in support of changing that so that it, it's not a crime uh, because then they could test it, perhaps, and that could save a life because then they could just test it and know that, that it doesn't have fentanyl. So it's moving through the legislature in Espanol. Este, nosotros, la legislatura en este momento está considerando una nueva ley que uh, por el momento hay uh, exámenes que se pueden hacer para las pastillas o para la droga para ver si, si incluye fentanyl. Por el momento, tener eso en tu posesión uh, es considerado un crimen. Entonces, nosotros estamos tratando de soportar el cambio en la ley para que la gente pueda tener ese tipo de, de, de examen uh, para por lo menos saber lo que están consumiendo. Este, no es para, para decir que, que queremos que consuma más, sino es para salvar la vida, por lo menos, que si van a hacer excepción, por lo menos que sepan lo que están consumiendo. Entonces, está, esperamos que pueda cambiar esa ley. Yo, yo estoy en apoyo de ese cambio. Look, we definitely have offices in Mexico. We work on a daily basis trying to work with the Mexican government to prevent the cartels from bringing drugs into the United States. We work on that daily, and that's what we're trying to do. We're combating that. We're doing our very best. This is Reagan. Question. In these past people with the prosecution, does that help you guys to deal with the Mexican cartels? I, I will tell you, we are taking every single case and we go back as far as we can. And that's why it's so important with the cell phones. Because once we link who the OD victim got the drugs from, then we're going to investigate that person and that person's cell phone, and we're going to continue to go as far back as we can. And every single step that we go, if our investigators can prove that the next level person was responsible for this pill, that caused this overdose, that's what we then will present to the district attorney's office or the federal prosecution, and we'll get together and see what's best for that particular case. But we'll go back as far as we can. And if it takes us all the way back to Mexico, so be it. Our arm can reach into Mexico, and we'll bring those to justice in Mexico that's doing this. Are the yes. precursors considered drug paraphernalia from the federal government's eyes, even though they're ingredients? So anything that they can put together to make this pill, it's all relevant. So it depends what it is and where it's at and how much they have and what they have. Do they have pill press? The precursors here. We'll put it all together. We'll bring it to S1 to make a case, and yes, we can put them in jail for that. Hey, Matt, uh, can I ask, let me ask a question. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I've been trying for years since uh, Stan first to get an uh, agent from the DEA to come on my radio show. I'll come on your show. Talk to this young lady right here. All right, and Sheriff, it's been too long as well. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. 
I don't know what I just Would you like to be on a radio we'll show? <laughs> okay. We'll see what I just booked myself for. <laughs> so it's a this is KPFT, you're you're fine. Yes, I brought a uh, a poster today, real quick. We we meet regularly with Dr. Stout, uh, and we work shoulder to shoulder with them, as do HPD investigators. There's a problem right now in terms of the backlog, especially when it comes to testing of drugs. And the backlog in the testing, unfortunately, is impacting the case backlog. So what we're doing is trying to shorten the time between the time that the case gets filed and resolved. So the faster we can get somebody, once that case is put together, into treatment, the better. The problem with Pleading cases without lab results is that you can't be sure that it is the drug that is charged or that it is even an illicit drug. And so that is a new effort on our part, working with the sheriff and working with Chief Finner and, of course, Chief Garcia, to try and work together to both get our labs funded in a way that can reduce their backlog numbers, not just with drugs, but with DNA. Uh, and on the county side, improve the time it takes to get an autopsy report. All the entities, those are, those are clutch organizations between law enforcement and the DA who have a hand in the evidence. And the time that it takes them to analyze draft reports and publish them matters. It matters to victims who have to wait longer. It matters to defendants who may be in jail. Uh, and it matters to the court system because we have many times violent cases that aren't being tried for four, five, and six years. And so we're working synergistically to try and prioritize what we're getting to trial and the order of things as we file them. Well, the investigators are dispatched to the scene because someone has died. And as the investigators assess the situation and the facts, uh, they have two paths. They can contact us from the scene and we can provide some counsel. They also work traditionally where they begin gathering evidence, talking to witnesses, and they put the case together. Our experts in drug prosecution also have homicide experience. That's Jim O'Donnell. And um, the idea is just like special agent in charge Danny Como said, you put those two experts together and you can really make this type of delivery of drugs causing death case or even something more serious where you've got intentional actions by dealers that result in somebody's death, even reckless actions causing death. So the full range of punishment is open to prosecutors on dealers. Make no mistake about it. I have not seen a bill like that. I know that we are concerned about a bill that would force labs to test everything that might have fentanyl because, according to our experts, darn near everything we touch these days might have a trace of fentanyl on it. So I'm very concerned about anything that will slow our labs down. I support uh, 
any effort and all effort, and it's going to take resources to make our labs timely. But your criminal justice system depends on it. Kim, you're obviously one of the great research, and I'm sure you reached out to other major cities as well as the DA. Considering that the precursors come from China, and you have the Mexican cartels who are producing a vast majority of these cases, considering that our community in this region has such a heavy influence of both, meaning people from China as well as Mexico and the cartels, how significant or how big of a target is our area nationwide in discussing this with other members of law enforcement? How big of a problem is it in our backyard compared to other cities? Well, we're the third largest, most populous jurisdiction in America. We're the second fastest growing. It's a, if it's a problem in America, we've got that problem here. <laughs> so no, we it's know here. That. No, but have you, been able to, have you been able to examine the numbers in terms of comparing it with other locations? No, let me let the chief of DEA the talk, talk to out. that. So for us, it does have a China connection. It does have a Mexico connection. And I can tell you, that's what we do. We investigate all these international cases. We're going after the CJNG, like I mentioned, mm -hmm. and we're going after the Sinaloa cartel. We have a ton of resources right now focusing on those organizations because of the mass production of, of fentanyl that they're putting and they're getting across, successfully getting across our borders. So it's something that we're looking at. It's something that we work on a daily basis, and we're attacking them. We're, we're beating them. We're, we're definitely taking a lot of them out. Can I ask you a question in that regard? Components come from China, made in Mexico, smuggled across the border. Do we not have any scientists or intellectual people in this country that could make it right here and forego crossing the border? It is being made right here. Okay. I haven't heard that at all. It is being made right here. It could be, be, it could be made next door to you in a garage. Well, I had some people next door to me in the cellar. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Well, you give us a tip, give us a call, we'll come look at them. <laughs> I have no problem doing that. Right. No, it, look, we're, we're talking about the Mexican drug cartels. Clearly, they're bigger than, say, a street gang that's in the neighborhood. But we're going after the street gangs aggressively. But, absolutely, right? So we're going after them aggressively. But yes, this could be made in any garage next door to you right now on your street. And, and I love to say, you know, it's, it's those individuals that, that has no background in the medical field that are making these. They're making it with $100, $1,000 pill press. They're literally taking spoons, amounts of fentanyl, mixing it up with curses and powder, and they're creating a pill. Well, it only takes two milligrams to kill you, right? So if you're mixing that with a teaspoon, there's nothing there. There's, there's no true measurement where this pill can be helpful to you other than creating an overdose. When are the interviews? I want to know when the interviews are. <laughs> <laughs> Is it going to be an interview or a debate? Let's go. <laughs> Look, I'm, All right. I'm passionate about I want to this. Thank, I want to thank everybody. I got one more question. I'm, I'm unclear on your question. Well, we, we file between 250 and 300 cases, 325 a day. Those cases themselves take time to resolve, but each day the cases that were filed previously are coming to court. And so for us to reduce our backlog by 21%, as we indicated last week, it means we basically had to work, our prosecutors, and our investigators had to work at 121% clearance on average to reach that, you know, improved number of backlogged cases. So we have our hands full. We don't want to wait on lab tests. We're working together with our law enforcement partners to get faster body-worn camera evidence, to get faster 911 evidence, and to get our cases readier for trial sooner so that we don't have to see victims wait 
five and six years for justice. It's just not fair. I want to thank everybody for coming. I think this is a good, good day for Houston. I want to thank my law enforcement partners and, most importantly, the folks who work with me every day. Thank you all.